just thought you might like to hear some bird song. Here we are in the wooded area, and here we have a lovely black cohosh, Actea racemosa. Um, this will get bigger, although the ones I have growing with a little bit more light will get larger than this one. And of course, it is the root of black cohosh that is used. Uh, black cohosh is mostly thought of by the popular press as the menopause herb, and Honestly speaking, I think that most women using menopause, as, uh, using menopause, using black cohosh as a simple, will be underwhelmed in its ability to alter menopausal symptoms. It, you know, will modestly improve them. On the other hand, if you take the black cohosh, again the root, and you combine it with something like chase tree and a little bit of sage and motherwort and a tiny hint of licorice, you'll get something much, much more effective and useful for menopausal symptomology. The eclectics with black cohosh said it was used for what they called muscular arthralgia, what today we would call fibromyalgia, and I find it along with things like uh, white peony and ashwagandha and acaranthes to be very useful for fibromyalgia pain. And then again, we use black cohosh for things like um, uterine pain, uh, can also be used for ovarian pain, but better for uterine pain, whereas blue cohosh seems to be slightly better for ovarian pain. It can be used for testicular pain, back pain, neck pain, uh, wonderful uh, analgesic, antispasmodic, uh, really effective herb in so many different ways. The one thing is you need to understand is that this is an herb that you don't want to exceed the normal recommended dose because if you do, it can cause in a really extreme frontal headache, which is quite unpleasant. So here we are in the herb bed, which is full of oregano and parsley and rosemary. And you can see the rosemary over there and there's some hops growing there and parsley and oregano and thyme and so what I'm looking at though are the calendula flowers and calendula, calendula officinalis of course is an incredible vulnerary used topically for scratches and cuts and chapped skin and diaper rash and things like that and of course internally it is a lymphagogue so it enhances lymphatic circulation um, it is also a mild alternative, and as such, it also has some beneficial effects on liver function. And we can see from the color of the flowers, which when you're looking at them on the camera, they look yellow, but actually in front of me, they look rather much more orange. And they are full of carotenoids, especially um, uh, lycopene as well as lutein, and so they are also useful for helping to stabilize the eyes, as well as being, as we said, a lymphatic herb and enhancing lymphatic circulation, being used for things like uh, lymph edema and lymph adenitis. So last class I mentioned golden seal, and here it is in its cage. As I said, the deer really seem to love it, Sadly, this is only the only plant I managed to bring from my old farm. Uh, we probably had 60 or 70 of them. Um, and I dug this one up because it was in an easy access location, thinking I was going back the next spring to get the rest of them. And that didn't work out. But so far, it's hanging in there. The deer have browsed it pretty heavily a couple years, which is why I eventually had to, to put a cage on it. Um, and hopefully it will keep them off this year. Eventually, usually it will get established and it'll start spreading, but um, so far with the deer, it has not done that so far. And of course the root is the part primarily used, but if you remember from when we did Materia Medica, studies have shown that including the leaf with the root inhibits bacteria 
um, inhibits the MDR pumps, the multiple drug resistant pumps in bacteria, from basically sequestering and excreting berberine. So it helps to prevent bacterial resistance to the berberine found in the herb. And of course, berberine is profoundly antibacterial and antifungal and quote unquote antiviral, although we're not entirely sure what it's doing uh, for viral conditions. And golden seal. Um, the black uh, letter symptoms or specific indications for golden seal is mucous membrane tissue that is boggy atonic with a tendency to over secrete, bleed and, and get infected. So it is really specific for things like gastritis, gastric ulcers, um, uh, gingivitis, gum disease, uh, ulcer, uh, um, uh, ulceration of the cervix, things like that where it really shines. For many of the other uses of berberine containing herbs, I will use more readily available things like Oregon grape root or barberry. Pleurisy root, Asclepius tuberosa, has those gorgeous, as you can see, orange flowers. And luckily the deer don't seem to be interested in them at all. And so the Asclepius tuberosa, also known as pleurisy root, is a phenomenal lung herb, especially for when it hurts to breathe. So when somebody says to you they have a tight chest, it hurts to breathe, um, think pleurisy root. Um, it can also be used for things like in, um, intercostal neuralgia along with black haw and pleurisy root also acts as a diaphoretic so for um, upper respiratory tract infections with fevers uh, it can be useful there as well and then behind that we have some monarda in flower and this is one of the cultivated monardas but still uh, quite lovely to look at it makes a very aromatic tea and then of course right next to it we have some yarrow and this is Achillea milfolium and yarrow of course acts as a styptic topically and internally it also is an anti-inflammatory to the gastrointestinal tract can be used for IBS um, actually it can be used for IBS D but also IBS C depending on what you mix it with and of course it also can be used for inflammatory bowel disease. Let's see if I can get a better shot. No, not that good. And of course, it is also a diaphoretic used traditionally for fevers, along with things like elderflower and or bone set. Here we have, there we go. Those of course are the flower buds and they'll be flowering in another, oh, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks, something like that. Usually, yeah, usually another couple weeks. And uh, those are then followed by a berry that starts off green and then is red when it is ripe. And spice bush, both the Chinese use spice bush, they use a slightly different species. This one here is Lindira benzoin, and it is one of the most common understory shrubs in the eastern U.S. And you can use the bark, you can use the leaves, you could use the berries, and you can use the root as they do in Chinese medicine, although the root takes a lot more work. Um, the twigs make wonderful chewing sticks, and spice bush is a great carminative. It is used for gas, nausea, vomiting, as well as gastrointestinal uh, pain. And um, it's one of the herbs in Chinese medicine that is used for things like hernia pain. So this is spice bushes. My uncle used to call it spice bush. Um, traditionally used in the southeast in both native cultures and in Appalachian folk traditions to help uh, as a um, uh, diaphoretic, especially for things like measles to help bring them out because the quicker they express, you get the, the measles lesions, the quicker they express, the quicker you are done with the measles. Also in the herb bed, we have some holy basil. And so this is Osimum tenuifolium and uh, formerly Osimum sanctum. And holy basil is probably of all the adaptogenic herbs, and this is what we'd classify as a probable adaptogen, certainly one of the easiest to grow. And, uh, and it makes a lovely tea. I like to combine it with other things. Myself, I'm not 
A huge fan of the taste by itself, but combined with other flavorful herbs, it's wonderful. And some people like the taste just fine all by itself. And of course, holy basil is mildly stimulating in the form of an adaptogen. It wouldn't consider it a nourishing adaptogen at all. And at the same time, it is an immune amphoteric, it is a nootropic, it's an anxiolytic, and an antidepressant. And so, and a carminative, and it lowers blood sugar levels. What's not to like about holy basil?